So God for probably 40 years or more. He asked me to say something nice about him today. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is really a big challenge. So an immediate uh, bit of writer's block took over. So I decided to enlist some help in that. And I went to chat GPT. And I put the following in. I said, introduction of ecologist and distinguished professor emeritus John W. Day, speaker at the College of the Coastal Environment Seminar. And this is what chat GPT said. It's our pleasure to introduce Dr. John W. Day, a distinguished ecologist and distinguished professor emeritus at Louisiana State University, who will be our keynote speaker at the upcoming seminar hosted by the College of the Coastal Environment. Dr. Day is a leading expert in the field of coastal and wetland ecology, and he has contributed extensively to our understanding of the ecological processes that shape these unique ecosystems. Over his illustrious career, Dr. Day has authored, authored over 300 scientific publications and has been recognized with numerous awards and honors, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society of Wetland Scientists, the National Wetlands Award, for science research from the Environmental Law Institute. As, keynote, uh, as a keynote speaker, Dr. Day will bring his wealth of knowledge and expertise to share with us his insights on the current state of coastal and wetland ecosystems, as well as the opportunities and challenges associated with their restoration and management. Uh, now, to be truthful, I, I do know a lot of good things to say about John, so I thought I'd add a few things that chat GPT missed, but I thought that was a pretty good job. Um, he was a PhD student at Chapel Hill with uh, the famous, eminent uh, Howard P. Odom, one of the leading ecologists of all time, and considered by many to be the father of systems ecology. Uh, John himself has mentored over 70 PhD and master's students. He's a re recognized, as the uh, as chat GPT said, one of the premier coastal ecologists uh, in the world. He publishes extensively on wetland deltas and related topics. He's also an, en an energy expert and knows a great deal about the uh, uh, about the biophysical or ecological economics uh, and uh, systems ecology, of course. He's one of the most heavily cited scientists at LSU and in his field, having garnered over almost 31,000 citations. He has a remarkable H index of 88, which is pretty astonishing. Um, he's, uh, as I said, um, he's published uh, also a number of books, 20-something uh, books or so, of which uh, one of them I'm a co-author on, uh, Estuary Ecology is a well-known text, America's Most Sustainable Cities, which is one I'm on, and uh, Ecological Modeling uh, uh, among his, his work. So with that, was that nice enough? Yeah, that was fine. <laughs> Uh, but I'm not going to say anything about wetlands, actually, or very little. I'm talking about a much broader uh, uh, topic here. So let's get started. I'm going to cover a lot of... Uh, hmm. Oh, I forgot to mention one thing. My wife had some advice for me about the introduction today. And she said that she refused to be in the room with the two of us together because it's just too depressing. Now, okay. John's going to talk about some serious stuff. And our job is to come up with some solutions to these challenges. Okay, so uh, this, this is the kind of the stuff I'm going to talk about today. The ideas of biophysical constraints versus, versus techno-cornucopian worldviews, global trends in climate, energy, population, et cetera, how these trends uh, impact society as a whole, and, and I will deal with coastal systems. Is the new urbanism and the urban transition a solution to 21st century problems? and which approaches will be most successful. Uh, so the, the, these, the, you have these two worldviews, and the second one is the one that prevails now, that, that it, 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 it includes uh, neoclassical economics. But the biophysical constraintist worldview uh, is that society is constrained by the laws of nature. That's, that's pretty profound, and especially the laws of thermodynamics. And all energy materials used by society comes from the biosphere in the sun. Uh, exponential growth cannot continue and scarcity rules. That's sort of a, a, a central idea in, in ecology. But there's a techno-cornucopian worldview where they say there's a lack of absolute scarcity. 
infinite substitutability, continuous exponential growth, and technological solutions for all problems. And this is Herman Daly, who was a professor here at LSU during my first uh, 15 or 20 years here. And he's a world famous uh, steady state econ economist who sort of in invented ecological economics. And he has this diagram of uh, an empty world and a full world. And the empty world was where the economy, the human economy was minor compared to the, the larger uh, e the Earth system and a full world where the con economy is basically uh, disrupting the Earth system. And in the, the, the empty world, the, econ the ecosystem provides most of the welfare to society, but now the economy does, and the ecosystem has been damaged. And the great source sink uh, functions of the, of the biosphere now, which were seen infinite for much of our uh, history of our species, are now essentially overwhelmed and diminished. Uh, okay, climate change. I'm not going to spend much time on this. I think most of us know this. It, we, it, some think that we'll hit 1.5, not permanently, but this year or next because of an El Nino. We have more stronger tropical cyclones. They're larger, produce more rainfall, move, move slower, lose power more slowly over land. Changes in river discharge, more extreme precipitation events, accelerated sea level rise, drought, wildfires. The area of the human temperature niche is decreasing. There's a, quite a number of publications on that. But here are some factors that really specifically to the Mississippi Delta. NOAA has published a, uh, a, some maps that shows between 1991 and 2010, rainfall has increased over the upper Miss and the, the uh, Ohio Basin, where most of the water in the river comes from, by 10 to up to 15%. So there's more water coming down the river and it, the Mississippi and the Chapalaya rivers are increasing in discharge, but there's a lot of variability here. So it, it's hard to get a clear picture and get worried about it uh, uh, too quick. And, and, and so, but it's likely that during this century and maybe by mid-century, the, the river will be exceeding the MR at the Mississippi River and Tributaries Project that was established after 1927 it would become a regular thing and they'll, it'll exceed the design capacity of the river for the amount of water coming down. And they have been near levee failures. This was in the 1973 flood uh, down by Donaldsonville. And the other thing is, is we're getting these intense rainfall events. The 2016 one that was one that affected our area and one that flooded my house uh, and I moved. So I'm a, I'm a climate migrant, but this is the Hurricane Harvey footprint centered over South Louisiana. And the center is right on New Orleans. And, and a storm like this coming would cause catastrophic following throughout uh, Southeast Louisiana. And in fact, up here where we live, it'd be almost like the 2016 flood. The, the pumping system in New Orleans can't sustain this. And in general, living below sea level is gonna be progressively uh, untenable in this century. All right, I'll put this in a uh, personal uh, perspective. And I got this idea from Robert Twilley. This is my family. Uh, that's my wife and her mother sitting there, uh, my son and our, my two granddaughters. So that's four generations, uh, 1926 to 2100. And if we go to 2100, uh, my younger granddaughter will be 89 and five of her eight great grandparents lived past their 90s, lived into the, their 90s. So she's got a good set of genes, and I think she she just has a chance. So we're talking about 175 years, six generations, and I'll look back on that in just a minute. Um, so uh, and I I got this from Robert. Uh, so we look on the on the uh, there's my lifespan if I live as long as my dad. There's my son's lifespan if he lives as long as my dad. Uh, then my grandkids if they live as long as my parents. They'll, they, my younger one will be alive at the end of the century. And, uh, and this, the youngest students in this class, in fact, uh, the, uh, the students who are coming in as freshmen this year have a good likelihood of living through this century if the processes I talk about doesn't stop them. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk about energy. Uh, 
the laws of thermodynamics, I, everybody knows what those are, except the economists, I must say. And the, the first law is the conservation of energy and mass, but the second law is the one that really const, uh, constrains us. And, it, you know, it says that no real work process, which is everything, can be 100% efficient. And that's the entropy law. And, and that's what we have to talk about when we have to talk, when we talk about energy. Uh, so here's, uh, here's energy production and GDP from 1800 up until the, more or less the present, almost the present. And you can see during, uh, during the, um, since 1900, we, we've had been in what's been called a great acceleration, uh, exponential acceleration in use of energy. And you see it's dominated by fossil fuels and it still is. And, uh, and GDP follows that. In fact, they're strongly statistically related to each other. And it's not surprising because it, GDP is the measure of a work of society and the work of society is the fossil fuels that does that. You need energy to do work in a thermodynamic sense. And so it has to be that way. And this is a two scale uh, uh, depiction of the fossil fuel age, which is that, that uh, peak up there, red peak in the middle. And we are right about here, close to peak fossil fuel production. I'll talk more about that. Trillions of kilowatt hours per year. And much of what uh, people talk about when we talk about the future and the renewable future is that energy consumption in this, in this level would just sort of continue sort of indefinitely, but nobody believes it will last the 5,000 years. But so this is a transitory feature of society, fossil fuel production. And the question is, are we gonna move to renewables which can do everything fossil fuels can do at, a, at the level that's happening? Now, uh, uh, Charles Hall was a, a fellow student with me back in at Chapel Hill in the late 1960s. And he's now, he published a paper with Jean Larrere, who was the first, first, one of the first people who talked about peak oil and uh, the exhaustion of fossil fuels. And they used a technique called Hubbard linearization. M. King Hubbard was the guy who really started the idea, talked about the idea of peak oil and made some predictions, which have pretty much come true. And uh, if you plot the, uh, the annual production divided by the cumulative production in percent, it, there's a lot of noise up front, but soon, soon enough, it comes on to a linear relationship. And if you expect, uh, put, that, put that linearization down to the, this axis, you get the ultimate cumulative production since 1895. So this would be projected. And BP and the International Energy Agency make projections all the time, and they use this number. Well, one thing you get out of oil and gas production is, is natural gas liquids, which can't be used uh, to run cars and things like that. So if you track that out, subtract that out and run the analysis, you're down to 3,500, and I think this is gigatons of oil uh, per year or total. And um, then if you take extra heavy oil, which is the tar sands in Canada and uh, the, the, these heavy, very heavy oils in Venezuela, the two big, big uh, places you find them, then it drops down to about 3,000. And, the, and then if you go back down and take out uh, fracked oil and get down to conventional oil and gas, uh, it, you're down to 2,500, or about half of this. So that what they're saying is there's only half as much oil and natural gas left as the International Energy Agency and of other organizations who talk about these things say there is. So we're gonna we're probably starting to feel the effects of energy shortages right away. Okay, here's here's uh, percentage diagrams of primary energy use starting in uh, 1980, and these are percentages, and you see. Uh, primary energy use is dominated by the fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas. Here's 2000, it, it's still above 80, 86%, 92%, 1% in 1980, 86% in 2000, and 83% now. So oil and gas still dominates the primary energy sources of society, and all the rest are over here. And, and then they project that by 2050, uh, primary uh, fossil fuels will still provide 50% of the energy. And that's not good news for the climate. 
Now, I want to talk a minute about the idea of net energy, so because we use energy to get energy. And if something, uh, and if, if, if something is going to be a strong, good, solid energy source, it has to have a high net energy. And this is an example of one of the first machines that was built. This is, was actually, it's in a museum now. And so you put coal in here, you burn it, you boil water, which ends up turning this big flywheel, which drains uh, uh, coal mine, which drains the coal mine in England and, and allow them to harvest more coal. And so that's net energy and, and it's been called energy return on investment, EROI. And that's an important concept because if, if, if the oil that came out of the ground, just getting it out of the ground, used all the energy, then it would be no use to us. But the oil came out of the ground early on and was very high net energy yielding. And here's what, back uh, in the 1930s, coal and uh, domestic oil had a huge uh, net energy values uh, above 100 or near 100. And as you come over this way, you're looking at uh, uh, other sources of energy, many of which have a fairly high net energy, but like uh, firewood is, it has a very high net energy, but we couldn't run the world off of burning wood. Although wood was the primary source of heat for almost all of human history where we had heat. And the a, 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 an important point here is, is you need an EROI at the societal level of at least 10 to 12 months to be a viable energy source in industrial society. Because the oil comes out of the ground, then you have to transport it and refine it and get it to where it's used. You have to build a road system and, and support agriculture, support universities, this activity we're involved in today. And so to, you have to say how much energy you need to, to get it through the whole energy tr tr trend of, of society. And it's around 10 to 12 to 1. Oil at best was around 30. Uh, whoops. Don't walk me. Uh, was about 30 to 1. Windmills are good sources of energy. They produce electricity, and it brings up the question of whether you can use electricity to do all the things we do in society. Uh, so it, it, just as an example of this, um, this is the spindle top uh, oil, oil well in Texas. They drilled in 2001, and, and they made movies about it and, it, and it did this for weeks on the end initially producing about 180,000 barrels per day was one of the most single productive oil wells ever. It had an ERA of much greater than 100 to 1 at the well hill. This is the Deepwater Horizon, which blew up in uh, 2005, it cost 500 million to build, $1 million a day. Matt Morschbacher, one of my PhD students, did an energy analysis and said that the EROI was, five, was less than 5 to 1, which means Deep water oil is not a suitable energy source to run a modern industrial society. It doesn't have enough net energy. So renewables, uh, you know, there's lots of discussion of this today, but the ERI is generally lower than fossil fuels. There's been relatively slow market penetration, although that's speeded up lately. It's intermittent. It's this, the idea of can you, substitutability. Can you use uh, energy? electricity mainly to run the whole society. There are resource constraints and the low energy density and their storage issues. And there's a lot. And here's a couple of examples of net energy, just to, uh, fusion power. Big news uh, a few a couple of months ago, the National Ignition Facility announced that there was a net production of energy in fusion. And what they did, uh, basically a 2.05 megajoule laser pulse resulted in 3.15 megajoules production of energy. And that's about enough to heat boil 10 kettles of water. And it lasted about a trillionth of a second, but it was a demonstration project, right? Uh, so even at that level, there's a net energy of about 1.53 to one. That number means if even at that level, if that's what you get out of a fusion system, it can't run the modern industrial side, it needs to be 10 to 1 or 12 to 1 or 15 to 1. Uh, but the experiment took about 322 megajoules of electric, electrical energy from the grid. And so that drops the net energy of 0.0086 to 1. And here, then you need the building and everything. The National Ignition Facility covers about three football fields out in California. 
Uh, and if you, you have to take that into consideration, because if you're going to have fusion power, you've got to have uh, places that produce, you've got to have power plants, and they have to keep running. And so if you take that into consideration, that it took 5 point billion megajoules to build and house these lasers, you get a, you get a number that's astonishingly tall. So I would say right now it looks like fusion energy is thermodynamically impossible to run a society on Earth. The reason it works so well in the universe, because it's what's happening in every star, is that gravity, after the Big Bang, gravity collapsed all of this stuff that was floating around into stars. And when, it, when they got big enough and when the power, the density, it, the, the density and the temperature got high enough, ignition happens and you have a, a, a star that can run for several billion years until it runs out of hydrogen. So, but, so it's very unlikely. When I was a graduate student 55 years ago, they assured us that fusion power was going to be running the Earth in 40 years. Well, it's 55 years down the road, and it's still that far in the future. So uh, biofuels, a lot of things, a lot of you read about energy into the future, and a lot of it's going to come from biofuels. Plants, the net energy of alcohol from sugarcane is about 1.2 to 1. Chuck Hopkins and I published my first paper in science in 1980, and we got that value. And this value hasn't changed. There have been lots of studies of the net energy of biofuels of all different kinds, and they all have numbers about like that. Again, that's not a number that you can run a modern industrial society. The big deal now is uh, industrial carbon storage. And, uh, and so it, it, you have to know if you do industrial carbon storage, how much does it cost to get that stuff underground? You know, CO2 or stuff like that underground. There was a, public, a paper published in 2020 by Sakara and Lichtenberger that followed the process of uh, how do you get stuff out of the air or out of smokestacks and get it into the ground and make sure it stays there, et cetera, et cetera. And what they, they were, it was a comprehensive literature review and what they found out that all of the methods of industrial carbon recovery, I guess it's called, were net CO2 additive. They were adding stuff to the atmosphere, not taking it out. And if it's really going to work, we have 40% more CO2 in the atmosphere now than we did in, in the second half of the 19th century. You would have to be able to, uh, it would have to be 10 to 1 at least, and maybe much more to get us enough carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to lower uh, the climate uh, uh, impact of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, I, I mentioned uh, that the 20th century has been called the exponential, exponential century, because you look at all sorts of indexes of, of, of society, and you've got these log curves, you know, population, fertilizer consumption, paper production, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason that happened, the reason the Industrial Revolution, revolution happened is because we had all those fossil, they found and used all those fossil fuels. That's the reason we had the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we had to develop the technology to get it done, but you've got to have a lot of energy that has a high net energy yield to have this kind of stuff. And people are now talking about the great deceleration. Here's, some, here's an example. Back in the, late 18, in the late 19th century, this is a typical uh, scene out on the plains up in, the, uh, in the, the northern plains in the U.S. Here's a combine harvested in a week with 33 horses, actually mules. So this is a 33 horsepower uh, group, five workers, and we had to get out, feed, human work, water and soil, stables to make this work. Here's a 200 horsepower mechanical combine with one worker and air conditioned, and but what what's what happened is that for most of human history, starting 300,000 years ago, when we became a distinct species, the, the, I would say the major energy source that allowed us to to prosper was food. We ate food and we used human muscles to do most work. There was also animals that helped us, and we burned wood mostly. Uh, and so food has gone from a net energy yielding in source for humans to one that consumes nearly 10 calories of energy to produce one calorie of food when it's eating, eaten. Here's another example. I flew 
over to London for to an Estrin Coastal Sciences Association meeting about 15 years ago. And you go online and do this. Uh, and you, you know, I'm going to here and I'm flying on this kind of jet and assume it's full. And you can calculate just this is a one way trip. I uh, used 7.8 times 10 to the ninth joules of energy and emitted 1480 kilograms. This is not unusual for a crowd like this. We do this all the time. But that amount of uh, CO2 emission and energy consumption is 15.5 times the annual energy consumption of an average person in the country of Burundi in Africa. It shows you how different we are in the, uh, in the wealthy countries. Okay, this, these are three curves. These are Hubbard curves that, named after the guy who had developed this technique of looking at energy. And it's the kind of curve you would get when you're using up any reserve of non-renewable resources. For instance, a, uh, an iron ore bed. You know, you, you start going, then the, 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 it go, starts off slow, then it speeds up, it reaches some peak, and it goes down and is exhausted. Because it, and the fossil fuels are non-renewable resources. And what these two people, uh, Maggio and Cacciola, did is they, they ran a Hubbard analysis and produced these curves. And these are robust because you have almost a century of data for coal, oil, and natural gas, and this is total fossil fuels. And this is the kind of thing that would happen if, if fossil fuels weren't affecting the climate and, and you know, if we wanted to use them, they would still run out like this because this is how a non-renewable uh, resource in an area works. And so total fossil fuels will peak uh, before mid-century. Uh, oil, conventional oil is peaking more or less now. This is uh, natural gas, it'll peak a little bit longer and coal will last longer. But by the end of this, this century, there will be essentially no more oil and gas and a little bit of coal. Uh, and this is the 50 years of the coastal master plan. Uh, here's, here's another interesting uh, uh, paper where these Fizan and Court did this analysis. They calculated the, the UK energy expenditure as a fraction of GDP. In other words, how much of the GDP did the UK expend to get the energy it uses? And what they found up, and this was from 1300 to up until the present, and they found before the fossil fuel age, basically, and, and the, two, the three major sources of energy that ran the UK, and in fact ran every society prior to the Industrial Revolution, was food, fodder for the animals, and wood fuel. That was it. There, there were other few, you know, water power from time to time, but mainly these were the major energy sources. So you add them up, and you can see that uh, the UK up until about 1500 was using anywhere from 60 to more than 80% of its GDP just to get energy to run. And so that means most people were poor, they worked on farms, they cut down trees and did things like that. Uh, the next, the major drop occurred with colonialism and what that was, the European age of, age of European colonialism. They went all over the world and basically brought uh, uh, potential energy from other places. It could have been wood, it could have been slaves, it could have been um, uh, precious metals and things like that. And so it dropped down to about 40%, but the real decrease started when coal and then oil and natural gas. Uh, here's when the second law came in. Here's when Mal Malthus talked about uh, population. Uh, and so by 2000 or 2010, we were, England was using only about 10% of its GDP to get energy it, it required to run the society. And, and all the rest of the energy could do all the things that a society needs. Industry, building roads, running universities, all of those things. And this is a graph of all the countries in the world. It's a World Bank database, and it's a relationship of per capita GDP and per capita energy consumption. Uh, it's a law of log scale, so there's a lot of noise in here, but this is a highly significant relationship. And what it says, is as your per capita income increases, both as an individual or as a country, so does your energy use. It has to, because GDP is a measure of the work of society, the real work, thermodynamic work. And uh, 
and, and so you need energy to do that. And we do a lot more work in industrial societies than for uh, agrarian societies. An interesting thing here is if you look above the line where, they're, where they use uh, more energy per unit of GDP, you get countries like Saudi Arabia, industrial countries, countries producing oil and gas, because, uh, and that allows countries to be below the line because they aren't doing those things. Like the, uh, the Europe and the US have exported most of their, much of their industrial activity to uh, poorer countries. And that's, uh, and, but GDP is related to energy consumption. It has to be because it's the work of society. And if you want a, a, you know, a rule of thumb to chat over when you go out and have a beer or something, or a cup of coffee, in general, uh, when you spend a dollar, when we spend a dollar in the world economy, about one cup of oil is burned. So a $10 po' boy uses 10 cups of oil. A $25,000 car uses 25,000. So that's a, that's a you know, it, it pretty much holds. And you find out that many of the metrics that describe the status of society, like wealth, per capita wealth, human development index, poverty, kilocalories of food eaten, the number of doctors per capita, and this is log infant mortality rate, they're, they're all related to GDP. The, the richer a country is, the better off they are in, in terms of all these measures. They not be, may not be happy, or, but these are real work issues here. And so all of these metrics are related to GDP, which is related to energy. So the status of society has to do with energy. And uh, lately in the last you know, several decades, there's been more and more uh, uh, looking at the neoclassical economic view of the world. And uh, Herman Daly is one of the major people that carry that out. And I'll come back to him. But my friend Charlie Hall, an, an, an economist, published a book in 2011, uh, republished in 2017, Energy and the Wealth of Nations. And they come down to their problems with neoclassical economics. They define economy independent of the biophysical matrix, describe economic production independent of physical work, boundaries that are inconsistent with and take little in consideration of the environment, and rarely tested. Many of the basic assumptions are not supported, not consistent with the laws of thermodynamics. That ought, to, that's the, that ought to tell you something right away. Uh, not consistent with pr principles of ecology that we who study it is, you know, uh, continued growth, uh, exponential growth, lack of absolute scarcity, infant substitutability. This is from a biophysical standpoint, those are all nonsense. And limiting nutrients, for instance, is a central uh, idea in ecology and has to do with that. And the basic assumptions about human behavior are not supported. Humans are likely to be altruistic or vindictive as rational. And it accommodates and even justifies the amoral exploitation of the weak and poor by the rich and powerful. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So here's Herman Daly. I had to, after I finished my work with Howard Odom, I arrived at LSU and almost immediately met Herman Daly and interacted quite a lot until he left in 1988 and went to the World Bank and then to the University of of Maryland. And he is far and away the, the most renowned uh, scholar that's ever come out of LSU. And he spent his whole career, he's an economist, he was in the economics department here, and, uh, analyzing and critiquing uh, steady, the neoclassical economics. And just here's some examples of economic nonsense. The effect of climate change on the economy. So the, and these are well-known economists who've done that. Even if the net output of agriculture fell by 50% the the, by the end of the 20, 21st century, it's only 1.5% cut in GDP because the value of agriculture in the US on the farm is 3%. You cut agricultural protection in half and it has no effect on the economy. People would starve to death, right? Here's another one. Value of energy for the economy. Likewise, the value of energy is less than 10% of total GDP. So a loss of 50% of primary energy would be a 5% reduction in, in uh, GDP. It's precisely because energy is so, has been so cheap that we can do what we've done. Cheap energy underwrote the Industrial Revolution. And uh, 
And th this is a great book. If anybody wants to read about this, almost a third of it is his words directly. And Herman Daly said this, my problem with my fellow economists is not their frequent state of disagreement, but rather their near unanimous unanimous agreement in support of basic policies that are killing us, climate change. Instead of critical debates on vital issues, what resonates from academic is a unison snoring of supine economists in deep dogmatic slumber. That's, that's a Shakespearean language. And so this is a great book and I would recommend it. Herman died last fall about three months after his biography came out. Urbanization. This, the urban transition occurred uh, just a few years ago. And it's when more than 50% of the people living in, on earth started living in the cities. This has already happened for all of the advanced countries, the richer countries, and poorer countries are still not reaching 50%, but the trend everywhere is in that direction. And the reason that can happen is because of energy, fossil fuels mainly. So, uh, and people have said that when, you, when people move to cities, you concentrate a lot of people in, in a small area that it, you can be much, mess, much more efficient in the use of energy and resources and transportation and all that. And so the more, if, if most people lived in cities, we could solve a lot of problems uh, that, are, that I'm talking about here. So let's look at this. In, in 1800, one or two or three cities had a, had a million people. There were cities in the past that had a million people like Rome, but it didn't last. It was a transitory. 16 in 1900, 74 in 1950, 442 in 2010, 500 in 2015. Uh, during the same period, world population grew by slightly more than seven. During my lifetime, and Dr. Delia, world population has grown by three times. That's, that's pretty remarkable. So the movement to cities was much faster than the growth of the population in itself. And the, the UN... Uh, says that population reached eight, 8 billion in November 2022. So we have eight, more than 8 billion people here in the world. So this, this is a paper, Berger et al., I was a co-author on this paper, that asked, looked at these questions about energy use, GDP, uh, CO2, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And what he did, what we did, he used the World Bank database and looked at Population balance, 100 to 100 is, is, the, is the urban transition where 50% live in cities and 50% not. So this is about 150 points here representing individual countries. And these are the, the statistical lines fit to that data. So uh, GDP from the poorest countries to the richest increased. Um, and this was, uh, this was like the last 50 years. Uh, something like that. So increase from about 10 squared on average, uh, I mean, for very poor countries to almost 10 to the fifth. So several orders of magnitude. So we're not talking about percent changes, we're talking about order of magnitude changes. And at the same time, energy use increased two to three orders of magnitude from the, from the poorest to the richest. CO2 emissions in, increased. And there, there was a slight there, this energy use per unit of GOT, GDP decreased, but that was about two orders of magnitude, and these are three to even more. So this is not, you, you didn't offset this increase in energy use on the, and CO2 emissions. So if you can go to a, a fully renewable economy with no CO2 generation, you're still going to be using tremendous amounts of energy, which is going to be demand tremendous amounts of resources. It, because we consume so much. Okay. So it, you see a lot of stuff like this if you read into this kind of stuff like I've been doing for a while. And this was a, a Scientific American issue. You know, the future is now and it looks like a city. Uh, the efficient city. And so here's, the, here's a, a stylized city there. You know, everybody's living in these big glassy buildings covered with solar panels and you have vertical farms and not too much traffic on the road. Uh, interestingly enough, they have gates to protect the city from flooding from the ocean. But so uh, you look at this city right here and there doesn't seem to be an area where the poor people live in the city, for one thing. Because living in buildings like this is expensive. And 
the idea of vertical farms, you know, growing food like this. And uh, we calculate, well, somebody calculated that if you had a one acre farm that was 50 acres high and you were growing food in New York City or someplace like that, for the same amount of money, you could buy 8,000 acres of Iowa farmland, which is the richest farmland in the world. It's a silly idea. You can, you can produce uh, certain kinds of crops for a niche market, but the idea that you're gonna feed a city like that, which looks kind of like New York City, with vertical farms is just silly. And what it doesn't, they hardly ever talk about it, is there are massive amounts of energy material and money flowing into cities and massive amounts output of waste. And if most people are living in cities now, then most of the impacts of humans on the earth come, are coming from cities. And this is the uh, world population growth uh, through 2019. Um, the world population has grown exponentially for two millennium, but uh, only since 1880 has it really speeded up. There were no more than two to three cities of a million. 2018, there were 550. By 2030, it would be over 700. Uh, 1945, the year I was born, there were 2.42 billion. This is more than tripled in my life. Uh, I, I gave a lecture to some freshmen, but freshmen at LSU during their life, which is 18 years, basically, 1.5 billion people have been added. And the world population took 10,000 years to reach 1 billion, basically the Holocene and it reached 8 billion in November 22. Clearly, this is not sustainable. And, that's, and much, much of the growth taking place in the world today. So this is a distribution of uh, cities in the world today. The, the red dots are uh, mega, mega cities, or, which are 10 million or more, and this bottom one is 100 to 500,000. So, but, if, and this is all of them on the, on the earth. And so, most of them are in the larger tropical, the subtropical tropical zone, and, and one of the zones most uh, affected by climate change. They're, they're coastal, uh, which again, coastal areas everywhere are being affected by that. So um, these, these are, the, the people are moving to the coast globally, but much more rapidly in the uh, larger tropical zone. And, uh, these are not the rich nations here. So we've got people who are less able to deal with these problems. They don't have the resources uh, moving to the coastal zone. And, and the resources, the provisioning of people in the coastal zone doesn't come from the coastal zone. It's spread all over the world, agriculture and fossil fuels and such. Uh, 5% of the world is associated with deltas directly. 40% of the population lives with 100 kilometers, 50% of the population 200 kilometers. So the people in the world live close to coast, but the stuff they use generally doesn't come from the coast. So here, this is a mega city. We've talked about it, uh, 10 million people. Depending on how you define them, it's between 33 and 46. If you take the 46, only seven are in developed countries, 34 were coastal, 38 were tropical subtemperate. And Tokyo has 37.5 million people, and this is equal to the total population in these states. These are, the, these are the least populated states, but it gives you an idea of just how many people live in Tokyo. Here's an energetic definition of cities. Cities are highly ordered, far from equilibrium, dissipative structures composed of people and their stuff that are absolutely dependent on input of energy materials from the larger systems which they're part. They exist in a quasi-parasitic relationship with the rest of nature. This is William Rees, who's an important person who's written on this. So dissipative structures, what's that? Well, I, when I talk thermodynamics with my 11-year-old uh, grand, granddaughter, uh, she understands, you see, she's got an apple in her hand. This is a high net yielding, low energy matter source uh, that she uses as a dissipative structure to, and produces waste heat, that's entropy, other waste, and, to maintain uh, metabolic functioning. So, uh, and every, every work process is a dissipative structure, a river meander, a thunder shower, a hurricane, tectonic traits moving across the surface of the earth, stars. They're all dissipated structures in the sense that they take energy, use it, change it to do work, and, and, and you, the result is low-grade heat out that can't be used to do more work. 
All right, here's a, here's a, uh, a, a, a quote from uh, Alice Munro. She won the Nobel Prize for Literature, mainly for her short stories. And the story was a woman whose husband was a fisherman. He died in a storm, he drowned, and she moved to Vancouver and became something like an NPR commentator. Anyway, she said the cleanliness, tidiness, and manageability of city life kept surprising her. This was not how people, this was how people live where the man's work did not take out of doors, take place out of doors, and where various operations connected, connected with it did not indoors, and where the weather might be a factor in your mood, but never in your life, where such dire matters as the changing haps and availability of prawns and salmons were merely interested and not remarked on at all. The life she had been living in, in Whale Bay, the little village, uh, uh, such a short time ago seemed haphazard, cluttered, and exhausting by comparison. And this is the kind of life that we live. You know, we live in, I don't know if you can call a lot of our cities well-ordered, but anyway, so let's, let's take, what does this mean? So here's, here, uh, this is in 2010, the um, Energy Information Administration of the U.S. government produced this graphic showing the metric tons per, uh, of carbon dioxide per person used by state and the District of Columbia. So you have over here a group of states with uh, more than 20, 20 metric tons of carbon dioxide produced per year, and that includes Louisiana. We're a big industrial state. You have a bunch of them down here where it's less than five. And so uh, the question comes to mind is, why can't places like Wyoming and North Dakota and Louisiana and Texas, et cetera, why can't we be like these people over here and do the right thing and use less energy? Well, it's, it's obviously the, let's see. Hmm. Here we go. Because these states do the cluttered, haphazard, exhausting work that supports the entire economy. These states produce forest products, they produce agriculture, they produce fossil fuels, uh, that, and so that the, uh, the, all of this energy over here in the balance sheet, which you say is applied to people in Louisiana, should be put over here to the people who ultimately use that energy, directly or indir indirectly, and you would get a very different graphic. Uh, this is a book by a guy named Ahmed. He called it Failing States, Telastomy System, Violent and Physical Triggers of Political Violence. He showed that uh, rates of political violence, climate change, and resource scarcity were, were related. So uh, this is part of our future, and we hear a lot about all the violence going on in the world today. But I, it, And uh, in writing our books, Chris and I, we reviewed this history of the uh, uh, ancestral Pueblo communities or the Anastasi in southwestern United States, and they they developed very sophisticated societies to to in, in this very arid region to produce food, store it, use water very efficiently. But during these mega droughts back in the 1300s that could last decades or even a century, these this society collapsed. All of them collapsed and they moved and went elsewhere and they disappeared as coherent to, uh, cities and such. And, and went, people who went back and looked at uh, human skeletons said there was evidence of malnutrition and violence. So when those when when you start running uh, short of food, uh, you, you're not having philosophical questions. And here, this is another book. Barbara Troopman wrote this really good book, The March of Folly. And uh, she defines folly as a producer policies contrary to long-term public interest by a large group. Policy must be perceived as counterproduction in its own time. It's like we understand what's going on with climate. And a large number of thought of people know that the policies are counterproductive. Feed alternative courses of action must have been proposed. And... Uh, but these are ignored. That's folly. That's how she fo defines folly. And uh, we wrote in our book, the failure to recognize the transitory nature of the fossil fuel age is one of the grandest follies of humans. In terms of these issues, the, the directions addressed in our book, folly is easy to discern. It's the nexus of unlimited aspiration in the world of finite resources, all driven by an eco economic system that depends on the economic folly of endless growth in a kind of societal perpetual motion machine. 
And another thing we hear a lot about nowadays is wealth and income inequality. This, I, I, there are a bunch of books about it. This is I, I like this one. It's full of graphs and data. And uh, the spirit level is the name of a carpenter's level in the UK, I think. And so that's where that title comes from. And th this is a graph that they produce, and they compared income inequality, the ratio of the top 20% to the bottom 10% of incomes. And this has to do prevalence of any uh, mental illness. And you see there's a fairly strong relationship there. And they related inequality to health, child well-being, trust, women's well-being, mental illness, drug use, that's all of these things. So one of the things we could do, we can't alter the laws of thermodynamics, we could decide as the world decides to become more equal in terms of wealth and, in and income. But how likely is that to happen? The reason we ended up in a situation like that is the super wealthy have manipulated governments and people to produce this kind of thing. So it'd be very difficult to address this, but I think we ought to not give up. So what must be done? Reduce climate impacts by eliminating fossil fuels. They're gonna go away anyway, we may as well get used to it. Deal with inequality, preserve and restore natural ecosystems to maintain ecosystem services. Because that's where the, all of the wealth of society comes from. It doesn't come from you know, economic activity that we see every day. Uh, mega consumption at all levels must decrease and population is gonna go down. And it's uh, the people, the young people in this audience, this is the rest of your life because that's what's gonna happen. Okay, uh, so what does a renewable economy look like? We, humans lived in one for uh, you know, 99% of their existence. Humans of all age doing man manual labor uh, for sustenance, slow moving vessels, limiting range of transport. And how much can new renewable change make to the hard work like food production easier? And there's a, another example. Okay, I'm ending here. And I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna use some art here. These are three paintings from the uh, mid uh, 19th century. Um, and this is 175 years ago. Remember I talked about my family following my granddaughter, uh, assuming that she's gonna live to the end of the century. So that, that was 175 year time span. We go back now 175 years. And this is about uh, maybe eight to 10 generations. The human race has been around for 15,000 generations. So this is very unusual for our period. The first painting here is uh, the Gleaners by Millet. And, it, and you can find a number of paintings. Gleaners are people who went into the ag fields after the crop was harvested. And there it is over there and picked up the leftovers and took them back home to eat. This is a reality, it happened. Here's a, 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 a group of, uh, tw uh, let's see, 12 of these big oxen type things with five people herding them, plowing a field in the uh, Nerve region of France. And this one bottom is a, from a, a detail from a painting called The Riverbank by a guy named Signorini, showing the hard work of five men pulling a heavy barge up the river Arno. And somebody suggested they probably were pulling a barge full of coal to, to burn in, in Florence. And here's the, these guys are pulling the barge and the, this guy's making money off of it over here. And you can see him with his daughter and the, the little dog. One more painting. This is the Ambassadors by Hans Holbein. He was a court painter for Henry VIII. And it was, it was painted in 1553, the year that Queen Elizabeth was born. The two men are John de Dentville, this guy here, and uh, who was the ambassador from the King of France to the court of Henry VIII. And this is George, no, this is de Dentville. This is George de Selva. He was the bishop of a place called Lavore in France. He's 29, he's 25. You don't find 29 year old uh, ambassadors to Paris or London these days. You're in your 60s. You got you got to have pull to get in there, and you don't find bishops at 25 years old. These are all old people. But the fact is that people had most half the children died before they reached uh, adulthood, and so you had to learn fast. And you had young people carrying out uh, uh, work that we normally associate with people that are much older. Okay. So here's some, here's some happy news. That's me 
my granddaughter. She's coming to LSU yet next year, next fall. She's graduating from Baton Rouge High. And the spoon she's held in her hand, that's the, the Schuin spoon. And it was first bought by my ancestor, William Schuin, who lived to the ripe old age of 54 years at this time. And I'm assuming that his parents, one of them or his wife's, sat down with him at supper and used that spoon. She and her sister are the 12th generation that have used it. So the one message is that the human race is not going to disappear. Uh, the second one is what really matters in these kinds of relationships, family, friends, community, et cetera, uh, are important. And uh, one more, and most people have said that she's cute and smart like a grandpa. Okay, thank you. I think there's time for a few questions. Well, I agree with you, but I was just making the point that that's an improper economic analysis. Um, going back in time, I'm way really far back as many as you. But when <laughs> I was in high school in 1979, we had the oil embargo and gas lines, and people wrote books, made money, went to TV, and then said, oh, yes, they went to a drop of oil, that's how the years got it. And now we're at the year 2000. So while I don't think it's going to get hurt, I think it's just going to hurt if we can keep finding more oil, finding more energy. Well, we're actually not finding more. What we did was go into the Middle, Middle East. That's what really proves. Then they found just off the coast of the Middle East a few years ago, one of the largest oil reserves that have been kept. Well, the people who do these analyses, it's not, it's, you know, they, they, those are in what's known, what's yeah. known as the probable reserves. It's not like the, it's changing the shape of those curves. No, no, I agree with you. Well, we're really not moving it further and further, and and the we are going to run out of oil. We're not going to continue to find oil and gas forever, and it's and it's already uh, the use of oil greatly outpaces the finding of new oil these days. <laughs> It, it, it may well, uh, it could be. And people are living not in the places that the resources support them are produced ultimately. Yes. Wait, let's see. There. Well, there is a notion, but it's a it's a com it's a combination of numbers and per capita consumption. So if, if consumption goes way down, you can support more people. You, you, yeah, it would still be a mess, and you're still using a lot of energy. The only thing you get rid of is the CO2, but you're demanding huge amounts of resources out of the biosphere that's already being impacted. The source sink function are already severely impacted. And so 
just changing to a renewable source of energy, which is not, you know, it's mostly electricity and electricity can't run a lot, at least now, can't run a lot of what we do in society. No, not at all. I, 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 you know, I obviously I can't answer that question, but uh, one of the ways the rich get richer is to keep the poor poor. And, and if you, and society would be much better off if the money Jeff Bezos spent on his half billion dollar yacht went to insulate poor people's houses. And you would get much, you'd get great climate benefit. You know, a boat like that probably costs $25,000 a day to operate. And that's burning energy. So, but I mean, it, uh, yeah, that's a whole area that people are talking about. That's, that's good. Huh? And anything else? Okay, thank you. Ah, I forgot to talk about this book. You know, offering Jonestown cocktail. <laughs> Let me see. Yeah, we're going to be, we like that one. Okay. Yeah. Over here. I ship the students don't eat all the food. Yeah. <laughs> this is one, one thing when they have their revenge. Yeah. 